a way of laughing at you because I know that feeling my back's been hurting all week. It's hard to get old. <laughs> Alright, we've been looking at the story of Noah. Last week we looked at the ark. This week he has the ark built. And now it's time for the flood. How long did it take Noah to build the ark? 120 years. Now, do you think that would be a witness to everybody that saw this construction project? Now, we went through the size of this boat last week, and it was a pretty big boat. Uh, don't you think that the news of this man building this on the side of his house would get around? Yeah. Um, and so, don't you think they would inquire what he was building this boat for? Did only Noah and the three sons and their wives help build this boat? No. Couldn't be. As big as this job was, it would take a multitude of people to build it. So here's the question. How many people got on that boat and were saved? Eight. Do you think that out of all the people that lived and died, only eight people were worthy of being saved? Had a relationship with Jesus Christ? No. no. That God put people to rest prior to the flood. Okay? As I said last week, was Moses the only one who was giving this last day message? No, no. Noah, I'm sorry. Thank you. Was Noah the only one giving this last day message? Who was preaching before him? Enoch? Before Enoch? Methuselah? Right? And so. They had a message that God gave them, a special message for that time to be given to that people, that the end was coming, and they fulfilled that. They gave the message. They preached righteousness. They preached salvation from God, in God, and only through God. What's the difference between that message in their day and the message we have today in our day? There is still only one way to be saved. And the world will hear this message and they'll either accept it or they'll reject it. The question is, is what are you doing with this message? There are over 90 people here this morning. Can you believe that? Amen. Amen. Look around. Praise God. But you're going to leave here when this is over with. And the question is, is are you and have you and will you continue to accept Jesus as your Savior? The only ark of safety to save you from the coming destruction. Here's the next question. Is there coming a destruction? Yes. Do you believe that you're living in these last days? Yes. Listen. Even if you don't see the seven last plagues poured out, if you were to leave here and die tomorrow, your probation is over with. Your time is done. If you didn't make the right decision the day before that, well, there's no time to make another one. The Bible says that today is the day of what? Salvation. Salvation. This is the thing that <coughs> just really blows my mind. There's two things, actually. The first thing is the love that God actually has for us. And all that He has done, all that He is doing, and all that He will do for us, all the days that we live, and yet we reject, there's, there are those who reject that. That blows my mind. To not understand or grasp the love that God has. And realize that it is given to you freely. And that all this is done so that you can have a relationship with Him. And yet we think that it's not good enough. Or it's not real. That we don't need it. What difference was there and is there from Noah's day to our day? Jesus said that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. So, you will live out this year and 
each day that God gives you, you will have the opportunity to make choices and decisions. The question is, is that if you've accepted Christ, are you an actual ambassador for Him? Do other people know that you know Christ? The Christ that they see in you, is it a true representation of the real Jesus? Because Jesus said that you are His hands, and I am His feet. And that when the world wants to see you, they're going to look at us. And when they look at us, who do they see? Do they see a true picture of the love of God? Because I tell you, brothers and sisters, if you look at the news or you read the newspaper, Christians don't have a really good uh, reputation these days. has nothing to do with the validity of who God is or what God is. But it does have everything to do with how much faith we really have in this God that we claim to serve. Do you realize that if you want your family to be saved, if you want your neighbors to be saved, that they have to be able to see Jesus in you to, before they can come to this Jesus? And that what they see in you has to be something that actually attracts them. This is another thing that has always amazed me about Jesus. Think about this. The scribes and the Pharisees, who were the teachers of religion back in the day, who controlled the church, did they draw people to them? Or did they repel people from them? Well, if you were a sinner, they repelled you. But Jesus, when Jesus came, and Jesus taught, did he attract the people to him? Yes. Who did he repel? The, the scribes and the Pharisees. <laughs> what was it about this man, Ray, that could make a woman caught in adultery feel secure in his presence? Truth and love. Truth and love. What was it that allowed a woman at the well who was there when nobody else was supposed to be there actually have a deep theological conversation with this man. Jesus. And when the disciples came, that's what she was normally used to. Okay? Their uh, reaction to her. But what was it about Jesus that kept her there and kept her talking to him? Exactly. <coughs> And what was it about him that really repelled the scribes and the Pharisees? He knew their hearts. I like it. He knew their hearts. He also showed the difference between legalism and true religion. And that legalism cannot stand in the presence of true religion. And if you hold on to legalism, you will surely kill him just as much as they want to kill him. Jesus, and we've been looking at this and studying this in our Sabbath school class. Do you realize that they had, what was it, 38 or 39 chapters on how to wash your hands so that you will be ceremonially clean? 38 or 39 chapters of just how to wash your hands in a proper way. And this tradition became so important and ingrained to them that if you failed to do this, it was just like sleeping with the harlots and it was grounds to be excommunicated from the church. And Jesus looked at that and told them, it's not the outward, but it is the inward. <coughs> outward ceremonies can never change your heart. <coughs> Do you know what the Greek interpretation for uh, hypocrite is? Without wax. Without wax. <laughs> uh, actor. Actor is another understanding of that. Do you know what an actor is? Someone who plays. I'm sincere. I'm sorry. That's without wax. I apologize. Okay. An actor. 
An actor is somebody who plays a part, who, when it comes to religion, as long as they look good on the outside, then they're good. But Jesus said, God doesn't look on the outside, God looks where? On the inside, on the heart. It is why you're doing what you do, the motive behind it. Again, was there any difference in what God was looking for in the days of Noah? When God was looking at the people? Looking for the same, right? Why was Noah righteous and found grace in the sight of God? Was Noah uh, had better character? Did he, did he have better bloodlines? What Noah had was a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You guys realize the part of the Godhead that told Noah, I want you to build me an ark because I'm going to flood the earth because the end of all flesh is before me. Who was it that said that to him? It was Jesus Christ. And it was the same Jesus Christ that followed Moses around and the people of Israel in the wilderness for 40 years. Yeah. In the pillar of fire and in the cloud at night time. Okay? So, Noah found salvation in Christ. There has only always and forever will only be one way to be saved. And that is salvation through Jesus Christ. So let's look at our text this morning. Uh, Genesis chapter 7, verses 11 through 13, as Ray read. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. And the rain was on the earth for how long? Forty days and forty nights. Now, when did Noah get in the boat? And when did God seal the boat? Okay, now you have to understand this, that... It says about Noah going into the boat, and then all of a sudden the animals come, Noah's out of the boat, and Noah gets into the boat, and then uh, it seems like Noah's out of the boat. When you read this from the King James, it can get confusing. Even with the New King James, it can get confusing. Especially once you get into the next chapter. But, you get into the next chapter, it tells you how long the water was on the earth for. Okay? In the 11th verse of this chapter, it tells you how old Noah was. It also tells you which month, which day that all this took place. This is important to help you get the chronological order of what went on and how long and if this is actually an accurate description of what happened. So it says in verse 12, that the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Verse 13, on the very same day, Noah and Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons, with them, entered the ark. They, and every beast after its kind, all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing. Every bird after its kind, every bird of every sort. And they went into the ark to Noah, two by two, of all flesh, which is, which has the breath of life. Now, if you read prior to that, it talks about the animals coming. And now you're reading this and saying, on the very same day, all this stuff happened. Okay? So, I've told you already, this is now written in chronological order. You have to understand that, or it will not make sense to you. It speaks of what's going on. It will go back and repeat what's going on. It may talk about what's going on ahead of that and then go right back to something else that's already happened. You have to understand that's the way it is written. And it'll make a lot more sense to you. 
So those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shuts him in. Now the flood was on the earth forty days. The water increased and lifted up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and greatly increased on the earth, and the ark moved about on the surface of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth. Now how many times has it just said that the waters came, the waters prevailed, the waters prevailed, rose, the waters prevailed. And it repeats itself over and over. What do you take away from that? There was a lot of water. The water got really deep. The water took and covered everything. The water prevailed. Prevailed over what? Prevailed over the whole surface of the earth. The water prevailed. Okay? Does that make sense to you guys? And in verse 19, it didn't just prevail, but the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. The water prevailed 15 cubits upward, and the mountains were covered. Now, how deep is 15 cubits? Any idea? 22 feet. It's about between 20 and 25 feet. 22 feet is very good. Okay? So you're talking whatever the highest mountain then was, it was 22 to 25 feet deeper than that. Here's the question. Was this really a global flood? Or was it a uh, isolated flood? What does verse 21 say, Deborah? And all flesh died that moved on the earth. Okay. Birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and every man. So see, this is the great debate. Uh, they, they stopped debating whether the flood actually happened. Now they're just saying that, well, there was a flood, but it wasn't a uh, worldwide flood. It was just a uh, geographic incident that happened in a local part. If that was the case, God didn't need to save them animals because there'd be other animals that right. would continue on. You know what I'm saying? Here's a question for you. What does it mean when it says the fountains of the deep came up? The plates in the earth were shifted. I like that. Do you understand that if you were to take all the continents and do a 3D mapping that they like fit together? One huge land mass. Okay, and when the fountains of the deep broke up, that it shifted continents. This was an entire global uh, flood. And it wasn't just a flood of water coming from the sky down, but water was coming up from the deep. When it came up from the deep, it was coming up with enough force and pressure to split the land. How much pressure is that? So here, here's what I like. And it said the ark rested on top of the water. It's like, you know, they were on this 40-day cruise. <laughs> what was it like for Noah in this boat and all these animals when this was going on? Did God just let it flood? Okay, the boat's supposed to save them and God just turned his back? Or did God safely guide that ark to safety? He had to. Do you realize that in the spirit of prophecy, it says that Satan himself was worried for his own life during this time? Did you know that? No. Think about it. Where could he land? Where could he go? Okay? Him and the angels that fell with him, that fell to this earth, were worried for their own existence because this catastrophe was so powerful. So, the waters come up. What does it mean that the waters came down? We understand rain, but it said it never rained before that time. When you go back to the creation story, it says that God separated the waters from below from the waters on top. What does that mean? We know what the waters below can be, but what was the water on top? And this is the thing that came down, the atmosphere, right? right. But it never rained, so it wasn't like the atmosphere we have today. Is that right? right? So it would be a water canopy that surrounded the entire earth. Is that right? 
If you ever wondered if you're here in Florida, how does it rain in Australia and it doesn't, you know, you'd have to, the rain would have to go. You understand what I'm saying? Earth is round, right? People in Australia are down here. When it rains, it comes from the sky down. But they're upside down. Don't think too hard about that. When this canopy broke and the waters came from below and came from the top and it rained 40 days and 40 nights, was it like the monsoons that we get now? No. Has the earth, after that flood, has it ever seen a flood like that again? No. We can see what a typhoon, what a hurricane, what five, six, seven, eight, ten days of rain can do. But it was nothing compared to what happened when God said the end of all flesh is before me. Now, don't you think if we have science today, they had science back then? Do you think they went to their meteorologists and said, what's rain? And, and is it gonna, what do you think they said? They looked at the natural world and they said, it's not possible. It's never rained. It's not going to rain. Now, I always understand this about science. Science does the same thing. Science looks at what's here and then makes assumptions. Because every science is based on certain assumptions. This is why it changes. You say it rains, and why is it? Yeah, yeah. So this, if you had a being that is capable of speaking planets and uh, atmospheres into existence, you think he would also have the power to control that? And that what he wanted done would be done? Did God have to ask the meteorologist if it could rain? Did God have to go to the scientists of their day and ask them, can this be done? Neither will God ask us if angels can break through the eastern sky and if Jesus can appear and be seen by every eye on the earth, whether it's round or not. But he does tell us. He's going to do a revival job that he will tell us. And he did that. How many turning years he will? I like that, right? A revival job. I like that. I like that. So the waters prevailed 15 cubits upward, and the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, and every man, and all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, all that was on the dry land, what? Yeah. Died. Died. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping things, birds of the air, they were destroyed from the earth, and only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. And the waters prevailed on the earth for how long? 150 days. Here's the next question for you. Why did God have to destroy the animal life? You can understand the human life. We became corrupt and we filled the earth with violence. But why did he have to destroy all of the animal life? Well, when you look into the prehistoric record and you start to see some of those animals back then, it will help you understand why God looked down and said, this can't continue. Right? Why was there no dinosaurs on the ark? Would you want a T-Rex running around your neighborhood? <laughs> Say that. It's some kind of dragon because we have little baby dragons oh, yes. And I believe that's what God created originally, which is why it went into the ark with Noah. But God destroyed the earth. Why? Because it was corrupt. Why were the animals destroyed? Because they had become corrupt. Right? Man, man screwed with nature. The same way we're doing it now. You Today? Have designer children. You know what I'm saying? We're at the same place now that we were then. So, turn with me to... Uh, second Peter. Second Peter. <coughs> we did this when we went through the days of creation. That, if you can find it elsewhere, especially in the New Testament, 
then it's pretty hard to gainsay that this is a fable and that the Bible only put this in as a fable. Okay? You find this repeated somewhere else in the Bible that either it's true or the book itself isn't true. So if you believe in the scripture, then there's only one conclusion you can come to. So, 2 Peter, chapter 2, verse 5. Actually, yep, verse 4. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and verse 5, did not spare the ancient world, but saved who? There you go. There's Noah. One of how many people? Eight. Now, how many people got into the ark? Eight. Eight, right? So... Peter was writing here, and he believed that Noah was a real character. Absolutely. When Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, then Jesus believed that Noah was a real character. Yeah. And when Jesus said that as it was in the days of Noah, he understood that a flood that was worldwide, that destroyed all flesh, except those in the ark, was just that worldwide. Yeah. And he made that point to let you know that when he comes a second time, it's not just going to come to America or the Middle East, but it's going to be a global incident. Amen. Let's continue on with chapter 2, verse 5. Did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight, bringing in the flood on the what? World. See that word? On the world of the ungodly. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes. Now people say, well, there's no such thing as Sodom and Gomorrah. But yet Peter is mentioning them as well. Condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. Let's go one chapter over to 2 Peter 3, verse 3. As it was in the days of Noah, remember what Ray read this morning? That the people scoffed at Noah? They made fun of him? Okay. What does Peter counsel us? Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in which days? In the last days. Walking according to their own lust and saying... Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from when? They were talking just in Peter's day that their fathers have died and their fathers' fathers have died, but they go all the way back to the beginning of creation. That nothing changes. Well, I don't know about you, but something changed from the beginning of creation to that flood. Right? See the scoffers? Flood didn't happen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. Won't happen. It did happen. And Jesus will come again. Amen. And when he comes again, Jesus will take sin and eradicate it. We in this church teach that there is no eternal.